we've kind of separated these into two big buckets here. It's, it's basically types of agreements that are most common up at the top, and then some of the other ones that we all work on that may not be as, as frequent. I think the overarching idea to, to keep in mind is the reason for these agreements, and I think it's twofold. I think the first one is to establish rights and responsibilities, both on behalf of the university that you work in, but also on behalf of, we don't really call them sponsors, right, since there's no funding attached, but the other party, and that party could be the federal government, it could be a nonprofit, or it could be an industry partner or another university. So it's really establishing those rights and responsibilities as they relate to, uh, we'll go through these in a sec, but confidential information, the sharing of data, working together to submit a proposal, for example, would be some of those. And I think the second one really is to offer legal protections to both the, the disclosing party and the receiving party if you're talking about data or uh, confidential information. So I'll go into some of the types. Our most common one, I think both um, when I was at, at Reno and when I was at San Diego as well was a non-disclosure agreement. Um, we work with, at San Diego, our industry group, our industry contract officers, were in the actual SPO together with the same contract officers that did federal proposals and nonprofits. Now that I'm at Berkeley, we have our industry officers are separated out, and they actually report up to our tech transfer office. So they're really the ones that handle the industry-related agreements. And I learned recently, too, that they do all of our non-disclosure agreements, whether or not the sponsor or the other party is, is an industry partner. Um, those are really necessary when a PI, for example, wants to keep confidential some, some type of technology or a patent application that's pending. Um, in those instances, we'll talk about this later, but we would reach out to our tech transfer office to help. Uh, in terms of data, that we've seen recently some of the big federal data sets that NIH and some of the other agencies have require you to sign off on a data use or data transfer agreement before you're able to receive uh, that data set, it's really protecting data that isn't out in the public domain. So something you can't just Google and download in an Excel spreadsheet, for example. Um, that's really the types of data that we're talking about, uh, patient data, student data, et cetera. Um, unfunded collaboration agreements are really what Jeff was talking about earlier. It's really a full-blown, most of the time, these are a full-blown research agreement. It has most of the same sections, but it may not have a budget at the end, right, because there's no actual funding being exchanged. Um, and then lastly is our memorandum of understanding MOUs. Uh, at Berkeley, a lot of them are international, so it's it's we refer to them as handshake agreements. So they're not necessarily um, a legal a legally binding agreement, but it's really just to establish, like I was saying earlier, rights and responsibilities for us at Berkeley and then the collaborator that we're working with. Um, and then some of the other ones that we see but aren't as common, uh, equipment loans. So we sometimes uh, we'll have equipment that we purchased, for example, on a federal grant, and we might loan it out to another institution or a postdoc that may have been working with our PI at our campus and needs to use it for their project and the continuation of their research. Uh, teaming agreements, I've seen more of these lately. Some of the federal agencies and even uh, some of the nonprofits ask that before you even submit a proposal, you provide them with a teaming agreement that says, you know, here are the rights and responsibilities of all the different collaborators that are participating in a consortium, and here's what we plan to do in order to submit this proposal. Some of them even include an addendum that says, you know, if this is awarded, here's what we'll do afterwards. And they might ask for a different type of unfunded at that point, like an IP sharing agreement or something. And then the last one is software licensing. So a lot of our, especially in engineering and computer science, we have PIs, researchers, and postdocs that are trying to either obtain free rights to a software that a company or a nonprofit might allow. Um, and a lot of those will ask us before we even have access to the, to the software itself to sign off on a contract. Um, I think that kind of covers it. Do you guys have anything to add that I may have missed? You know, just to, we, we highlight here that the most common types of unfunded agreements. However, we are seeing growth in some of these other areas, specifically the software license agreements. I think as we see a push across all universities to have be a better understanding of, of where their technology is going, we're seeing more and more of these software license agreements from other collaborators, where previously, uh, you know, software might be uh, shared among collaborators without any formal agreement in place. We're now seeing, you know, this increase in recent months where, you know, institutions who are loaning software to their collaborators uh, or letting them use it, um, they want to put something formal in place with, with that collaborator. You, um, and also you, you in the audience might be wondering why there's an asterisk next to DUA. Uh, that, that brings me to a point where 
uh, agreement types, the title at the top of the agreement might not necessarily reflect what the actual agreement is about. And that requires a little bit more analysis. Uh, DUAs are sometimes called DTUAs, D uh, data transfer and use agreements. And sometimes the other institutions will have an MTA agreement, material transfer agreement, which is re referring to data, but it's not truly a material transfer uh, the way that we handle material transfer agreements. And that's a completely separate body of knowledge and has other compliance issues uh, that, that are um, involved. Katarina, I think that's a great point, you know, bringing up material transfer agreements. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole nother agreement type, at least at the University of California, San Diego, handled by a, a different area uh, of our central office because it requires such expertise in understanding um, the nuances and compliance issues associated with transferring of materials.